What is it? What are you after? Hey, what's up? Hey, the flame dog attack. Well, hello, things as usual going on here with the. Mate, I know you don't like me training, I should spend all my energy and attention on you, but respect the fair use. I don't know. So, everything going on here as per usual. Last lesson we started looking at the idea of how to set a configuration and we've also looked at... Um, no, we'll go out in a bit. We've also looked at and started building our understanding of various things around footwork and then explosive footwork, how we set the configuration and also starting to think a little bit in terms of combinations and no, there's lots of other stuff that, that we need to look at we can only go step by step so that's that's one thing to say that yes we've got lots and lots of stuff to talk to talk about and learn and we've got lots of stuff we haven't even looked at yet like defense and we've not even started bringing it into hitting objects and actually sparring and doing stuff like that so we've got all of that stuff to focus on and look at and the other thing i wanted to say is so we've looked at setting the setting the posture the way that, that we can hear it usually with the, the root and I mentioned then that it becomes more complicated of course when we use a step so if we just use like a like a normal step let's say we're just going to do a step and a and a jab a, a hook lead hand hook and we very often we don't hear the the set and I and I mentioned this idea that usually when it's the front foot unless you really exaggerate it well, you usually don't hear that the way it hits the floor like that. And another thing to mention about that is this is a very flat-footed paradigm. And yes, you, you see this in Xingyi Chuan, but only in some schools of Xingyi Chuan where, where they've made this kind of conceptual leap where very often you'll see the the, the heel down and then the into the like that, into that kind of movement. And you can see the development of the idea that it's all about power generation and like the idea of rolling, you know, I talked about the idea of rolling on the limb like that, which, which is something we sometimes do in, well, the concept we sometimes use when we're talking about stepping. It's kind of half rolling on the limb to just generate, you know, all the body weight going forward. It's the same principles as doing that with the scrape routing, like just, like you step and you roll into it and you hit. And the set point is the, the, the front ball of the foot, like, like that. And you can see it's the same idea and again it comes into this this concept of within structural movement within the paradigm there's lots of different ways of doing things and usually every way has its day there's some there's something somewhere where you you use that posture in that way i think the other thing you can think of straight away is something i'm quite fond of doing in sparring and it's very much a shoe wearing thing where you just <laughs> onto someone's toe and then and then keep keep your foot on the toe so that when they pull their foot out they stumble and then you hit them like that. I'm quite fond of doing that and I think I've got I think I'm doing it in more than once in the videos of sparring that I've got up. But in some struggles of Shin each one they change this to a much flatter footed movement. And one of the reasons for that is that the heel can slip really easily. So I've talked about this before. Like, but the, the scrape rooting and the flat foot grouping can also slip really easily and I've also talked about that and nothing's ever perfect, it's you've, you've got to be able to adapt but if you always do heel first into the, into the movement like that just you're going to slip sometimes, like a percentage of the times you're going to slip depending on the surface or you just step on a little stone and as I've said before, you know, when I was training in lockdown in a car park it was full of all these little stones and I, and I realised for the first time, it's the first time I've really trained, I'm either training on a field or I'm training in a sports hall, and training on that kind of surface, like, and, and the roots started just slipping, and and I adapted to it, and I started becoming more aware of it. The most important thing is, you can't always stop it, but what I could do is improve my reaction, so that when it did happen, I immediately tried to adapt and change into something else. So, but if you're... If you go training, like for example, on a field that's a little bit wet or a slippery surface and you're always heel first like that, you're going to slip that way and there's nothing to stop it. And this is this is the issue, this is the genius of the changing it to a flat, flatter footed method that you can you can stop it a little bit. There's more on the floor, you don't just go straight into the, the splits. 
and particularly as it evolves into each one that you hit with the, the front part of the floor. It's the same it's the same conceptual idea, it's trying to use the same law of physics to do that, to get that. But it's kind of overdetermined that there's a limit really to how fast you can get power in with that, whereas with that straight away you can get much more power in it and you can set the posture much more easily in the as the heel hits the floor you can set the posture really really solidly in a way that's a lot harder to do like that with the with the ball of the foot like that because it's all in line with the leg and it all releases force that's straight down into the floor whereas your front foot your toe is not in line with the leg and it hasn't got all this force directly above it so it's all mostly just coming from the ankle and doing that doing that motion like that and it's over determined then because also it's much less of a slip risk to do it like that to do it like that you can just control it a little bit better if, if, if the ball of the foot lands and slips you can still just catch it catch it with the heel while it still slips sometimes it's inevitable so obviously we've got pivot routing and different kinds of kickback and routes where the, the, the heel comes up off the floor like that obviously but we've also got a whole range of routing techniques that use this flat footed this flat footed way of moving and I've mentioned before like some are for close range and I talked about in the last video why you can't generate the same the same force with the leg and, and I also saw something very interesting which was someone it did, you know it, it, it is what it is like you know each one's getting a lot of attention at the moment and you've got lots of people who are kind of jumping on that bandwagon and talking about it and it's a little bit in some ways it's the last thing we want that because because people start like interpreting ideas that they don't really understand but people saying this person was saying like energy spirals up from the floor through the leg into the into the hip point and you know, i talked about this in the last video that you know, people did used to think like that in many ways but actually we can demonstrate scientifically that it's not like say we generate force from the leg that doesn't transfer up into the body because i can just like a tiny tiny little bit that's caused not by the leg moving it's caused by the set point when you set the posture so it makes my shoulder show a little bit like that the energy itself doesn't spiral up from the from the leg that energy that's produced by the leg doing that is all going that way and the posture is setting and that's what i would do if i was going to hit with my leg that that way i'd do it like that something like that that energy doesn't spiral up into the body it's the set point where it solidifies the whole structure and then the far leak around the around the axis whichever way it is the axis is working which kind of far lee we're developing with primarily with the upper body but then using this crooked axis to generate force so it doesn't spiral up from the floor into the into the arms it's just like a superstitious idea that like it's not a coincidence that the people who talk about that stuff actually can't demonstrate the the concepts with real power so it's physical body knowledge when you get it then you understand it but we also very often want to use flat footed movements not just from close range but with steps and this links into the the principle that i've talked about multiple times that we don't want to lean over the pivot route so if our foot, foot is up on the the toe we don't want to lean over in particular as we're using kind of explosive force you can just pop your own ankle or just throw yourself right off balance like with the the lead hand jab say we use the pivot route but then when we step we use the seeking step so that we don't so that we don't go over on the and it's exactly the same but a little bit of a different concept when we go backwards that we can use the pivot route like that for example into a cross but we never if we're gonna put our weight over the back leg then we don't we don't do the pivot route like that and for, for again it's over determined one you can't get any force like that because you've lost the you've lost the set point into the into the posture that you really need for that that hit back posture with the, the back of the shoulder it's very hard to do it with you can see straight away that this is not like like this is your like scientific basis of each one and this is your scientific empirical proof that let's say you've got you've got your your magic power people and they can just do that and it doesn't really matter what they it doesn't really matter what they do they can just issue force so they say but they can only do it with a you know 
a, what is it, a dupe. <laughs> Someone who's part of the group who goes along with it. They can only do it, they can't actually do it on a punch bag or anything like that, which is a bit of a bit of a dead giveaway if you... And I've also seen someone else saying that they can issue electric... As I'm, I'm always mocking this idea and saying, like, it's not like electricity. I've seen someone say that through standing they can turn themselves into, a, into an electric eel. And I've also seen someone say that, that standing develops units of chi. <laughs> I mean, she means like vapor. Like, I'm not quite sure how you have units of it. Or anyway, none of these people can, none of these people can demonstrate like this because they haven't got the real thing. They haven't got the real science of each one. That's what we're trying to do to bring this to the people, to enlighten people about the the reality and the genius of it. And you can see that it's right because you can see that in certain certain ways that contradict the principles we're talking about, we can't do it. And that's be, that's why we've got those principles. So. It's very hard to issue force with the with the pivot root up like that going backwards. When we do it with the with the cross like that, the energy is going forwards, not backwards. And then of course it's always determined because you can see I mean I almost went over then just doing it, but you can go over and you can go over on your ankle like that. So to use to use force like, like that, you've got we use the we use the flat root and keep the foot flat like that. And usually it's quite close range as well, so it, it, it's over-determined again that we usually use the flat root to set the posture, which you just can't do with the, the pivot root like that. So to, to set the posture with this pivot, the energy's got to be going forward like that. So it's setting like that and pushing forwards like that. Not like that. Then the next thing that we learned is we want this we want dynamic stepping, so we want explosive movement. Um, so we've been practicing like to get the feeling, and then I mentioned that we can then change to, and this sets the posture. So the, when we do it like this, we only just like kind of lightly, lightly feeling. And it just this just occurred to me the other day that. Very often in previous generations of each one, this hasn't been clearly differentiated in the way that it should have been. Like people are doing it in practice, but not explaining it conceptually. That very often when they say farly, what they're really talking about is is the is the lock point with the setting of the root. So you'll see people go. Oh. And I'll do something very light like that. And really what they're demonstrating is the, the lock point with the set root, the way the root sets like that. And you can go and see any of the legit old each one masters and see them doing that. And then when it goes up into that change of quality, then there's just a whole range of other considerations and things that happen that we've got to think about. So when we're practicing like that, that's the lock point. And the set point is really light, like the heel, the way the heel goes into the floor. And then when we do it more explosively, the heel hits the floor a little bit harder. That makes it more of a slip risk, of course. That's why we also, it's one of the reasons why we keep our weight back like that on the posture, usually. Every rule's there to be broken, so sometimes you can you can lean in, you know, if that's the if that's the right call at the moment in the moment, obviously. But for our general posture, we don't usually feel the until you're made consciously aware of it. The, with the seeking step, the the front part of the foot hitting the floor, and then the heel hitting the floor down, and that's the set point. Just as if I go. <laughs> Was to do it like that, so but then when we do it explosively, the, the set point is harder, the heel hits the but you usually don't hear it so much on the front foot. And then, if you do it on the back foot, the set point is the, the ball of the foot. Usually, both of the feet are set points. So this is the other idea that we that we kind of got across in the previous video that very often both of the feet will hit in a certain way that sets the posture. So, but if we go if we go back from a backhand punch, the set point is the ball, the foot. And that usually hits a little bit harder and a little bit louder, but we usually hear the front foot, the heel of the front foot set as well. So they'll both set like. So I'm just emphasizing it a little bit so you can hear the set point a little bit more. 
then what we want to do next is kind of push, push forwards. There's no time to waste. And think about some exercises now that we can use explosive stepping with combinations and using idea, our idea of this, the set point of the configuration. Um, we're going to begin with, we're going to step in like that. So the heel hits the floor into the, the lock point and the set point. And then we're going to change like that. And when we change like that, a different rule comes into play that I talked about before. And all this is, is, is empty step, empty stance from traditional washu. Um, where just this front part of the bowl, the foot hits the floor like that, but it's not up, over like that, so that the, there's an ankle risk. It steps, steps like that, and all the weight is kept back. It, it contradicts a little bit. I mean, it's a task specific adaptation. It contradicts the idea that we shouldn't use a pivot route for the front, <laughs> front punch like that. But usually it's the kind of step because if we want to do it like, if we want to do it like that, all our energy is going forwards. But if we do it like that, most of the energy is going backwards and we're just hitting out. So actually it's like a, it's more of a kickback route, but it just happens to change into this. Punch. And the reason we do it like this is we can, we can do it flat like that, but it's much more of a risk, what we call stubby, a stub risk where you hit with the bottom of the foot and that causes you to go over on your ankle. So it's actually designed to stop that. So like that, onto the, into this empty stance, empty stance posture. So one, two, like that. And the backhand changes into a changes into a jab, and this is the kind of thing we want to do all the time in each one. Like, what what was what was the the lead hand changes into the backhand just with a change of footwork, and what what was going to be a let's say a cross changes into a hook just with footwork and things like that. So, and also. These kind of exercises really train your intent and its ability to manage and control the physical form. So, again, this way. So, like that. Little step. Just a tiny little step, like the kind of Guo Yun Shen death within one inch. So, we don't want to usually do a massive overstep because it's really easy to see. It's really easy just to kick away. It's just a little. And the bigger the step, the bigger you make it, the less easy it is to get it. the step itself exposed. So it just becomes a little bit more difficult to do a bigger step. And I'm lengthening the, you see that I'm lengthening the posture and then to get the bigger step, so it just becomes a little bit more vulnerable. These are all task specific adaptations you've got to think about. One more time this way. Like that. And the other way. So, little step change into this posture, into this empty stance. So again, little step change. And I'm using a couple of I'm using one very key task specific adaptation there that because I know I'm going to do this posture one I'm just keeping this little back leg up a little bit more almost like it's going into the pivot room so see the heel is off the floor the step so I can spring into the spring into the next but you can do it like that and practice it like that at first with the, the back foot completely flat you can call this like the beginners like that, completely flat, and you could hear the, the posture set more like, like that. Whereas if I know I'm going to do this, or in the split second, I mean, these are all calculations that your intent makes. I said before, I, I don't even know how it happens. When I look at the stuff I'm doing when I'm sparring, I just think, if I'm just walking the dog and I try and imagine doing stuff like that, I can't imagine how I would ever do that stuff. It just happens, the intent takes over, and it happens on an entirely different 
All I do consciously is practice the drills and the standing and the slow movement and then it knits together and the intention takes over and controls. I just give it the tools and it does what it needs to do. So you do little things like just onto the onto the half pivot root like that so that you can spring into the into the next posture. And this is a particular kind of step that just evolves when kind of naturally when when you start using explosive footwork although we have drills that we use to that we used to train it. Oh, this is one really where we change it to the like that. Just, just coming up onto the off the heel then changing into the posture. Give both a try, try back foot flat and then change like that. And then just try. You can hear the difference so that's the posture setting from the back foot. Remember it sets from both feet, but I really emphasised it. But if I go like that sound's not there because it's no longer setting, I've come up on the back foot like that, ready to spin. It's also really really useful for things like kicks and things like that. And that's very much the kind of thing that because you drill it, because you drill it, your your body just kind of naturally does that and it, and it manufactures the sympathy for the next movement. Which is a key idea we talked about before. So, for you, practice one flat footed change, and then just practice one just not flat footed heel up, then change. Practice both. As soon as you start, as soon as you start practicing those things, as soon as you start having them as tools that you can use. So, our next posture is going to use moving to the side. I'm going to like that onto this kind of pivot root when we go to the side. And again, it's because the weight is back and the energy is going that way, so it's a kind of kickback routine like that, it really solidifies the, and it's actually much more dangerous to do this flat footed because that's where you've got your your buckle risk for your ankle. So we're making all these task specific adaptations with the rooting and the footwork and they're all over determined in multiple different ways. So one like that. And also this then is complementary routing even into the explosive movement. Because the foot is up like that, it can spring, and we're just going to spring round like that into this kickback routine. And the posture is going to set into the lock point here for the cross. So, like that. And you can see that's much more like a, like the original way we started practicing postures. It's not quite using our somatic timing. So if we start using our somatic timing, we can get it a little bit faster. Like that. Using our somatic timing into the posture. I know the movement's a little too small to be powerful, but you can go and see me on the bag doing it and just see how much power actually can be demonstrated doing that. Mate, it's too dangerous for you, go on. Too dangerous to be at my age. Good boy. So the other way, one into this kickback. And this leg goes goes first and roots the posture into the hook. Sets and hits. We try and not get a split harmony with this, so we don't go one, two like that. We try and get it harmonious, and we use the the posture sets as the as the punch hits. Remember, if you can go one, two, like that, in which case the posture sets at that point, and it's a split harmony with the step, but we don't want that, we want it on the, so. And then, instead of stepping and changing like that, we just, from the hips, from the qua, use this explosive movement from the qua. How, like this. Yang Cheng Fu, great tai, tai Chi Chuan master says like, if there's a problem, check your hip movement. If you can't quite get it, check your hip movement. For this, done like this, yes. If there's a problem like in speed, check your somatic timing and the relaxation of your, of your shoulders. So, 
And this is just exactly the kind of power generation that you see talked about in every kind of chat, every kind of traditional martial arts really like. Anything that's kind of descended from China, karate, Shaolin Chuan, anything like that, where you have this kind of hip power generation of force. It's exactly that quintessence principle of Wushu. And again, you can see Wang Shangjai's argument that this, this is the original, maybe not with a hook, or maybe just like, just big, big, these big limb movements that were the original Wushu of the ancients. And this principle of, with the, with the complementary routing, how that then over time becomes transformed into, becomes overly formalized, as Wang Shenzhai would argue, into that kind of movement. But again, so once more like, like with a broken, so we break the combination into two movements and then by bringing our somatic timing in, we compound the movement into kind of one, with the, and remember we've talked about all of that and how you sometimes have to put, you have to make a decision like, is it 50-50 on the power? You know, is it 25% on the lead hand, 75% on the back or vice versa or so on? Is this one even just a fake and then the, the first one's the, all the power? These are all decisions you've got to make or the intent's got to make. So using our somatic timing, Okay, next, let's do something a little bit more. Moving up a category of difficulty and sophistication. And you know I always like to do that because it, because it's cool. And also it helps people to understand just how sophisticated this paradigm is, just how well thought out it is, how well it links together and how many levels there are. And just when you think, oh, that's really great. And then there's just something else and everything just builds into something else. This concept of escalating basics. Um, and what we want to look at now is what we call, we want to do two things. We want to look at doing two punches with the same hand using our somatic timing, which I don't think we've looked at before. But I want to also introduce the idea of a sliding set or a slide set. So the slide set is very simple. It's just like that with the foot, just dragging on this part of the, in this case, this ball of the foot here, this slides around like that. So as the punch hits, it slides. So the actual set point is moving when you, it comes to a stop and suppose you could say, technically in theory, that, that stop point is the, is the set point. But in reality, you feel when you hit, that you hit at the same time that the, the foot is sliding. And then by definition, that very often means like, there's more weight on the, a little bit more weight on the front foot. And we can do it just like jab, jab, and then quarter rooting, so it's just like, we don't even do it consciously. Again, this is just like, it's, it's a kind of somatic time where you just let it relax. What I meant to say, by the way, like if you go and look at the, something else I was looking at, the older generation of each one matters where you're looking for their somatic timing. And very often they do it like, <laughs> And they exaggerate this. I don't even know if it's exaggerated, but they have this bounce on the bounce on the movement. That's somatic timing. It's what you would like if they do it like you do the punch on the on the. That's the somatic timing. So it's not just about learning this generation, the steps forward in this generation. It's about learning that where this comes from, how it was done in the past. It's not, it's not different in fact, it's just usually we do it a little bit smaller now, rather than, next, rather than doing it like that, we generally just go straight into the, into the lock point and set and into the movement, but the actual movement, the actual physical, the rules of physiology that we're using are absolutely identical to those that were developed for us by the, by the previous generations. So we do that and it just kind of relaxes. And then we just use this slide set into the into the movement like, into the hook like that. We just change a little bit, just change off angle a little bit, 
for an off angle pump so there's some more sophisticated use of footwork and we need our somatic time it's, it's still like that one two before we've gone one two like that with the one two now we've got to go one and then relax in there so it's like a double like you know what i'm saying instead of one two it's one two one two one two but it still uses this same concept that we need the relaxation from the from the shoulders so onto the pivot route and then the slide set like that i'm going to do it backwards so you can see we'll just create a little bit of an angle the slide set it's only moving that it's only moving that you can do it a lot more you know but it's just that's still a slide set but it's a much more advanced kind of slide set i've talked about it before when i talked about opening it up like that and the foot skids around like that on the on the ball of the foot it's exactly the same kind of concept there as like you know in traditional we'll show you do front sweeps and back sweeps and a little part of the foot just stays stays on the floor it's the same so it's, it's the same posture it's just done higher that's so all these things are in traditional we'll shoot when we're big we'll come back to that another time i've shown it before but it's a more advanced version of the slide set but we'll focus on this for the moment so again one and we use the so if we just do our, our and you can practice this as well just on its own like that using the using the somatic timing like that and the more power you can get into it the more you can get the more you can get on the somatic timing the more you can get on the farley and the more on this second one like that that it just pulls the sliding set round like that into that thing and you can see now it starts to change others like i said before like if i do it this way it starts to change other of our rules it's a task specific adaptation that we now hit him with the front foot front hand but our weight is on the our weight is on the front foot and our back foot is now pivot route for a for a front hand punch i flagged that up quite a few videos ago i think that we that we do that at certain points so it's very confusing if you just download everything that once into people you've got to kind of understand the rules exceptions to the rules reasons for the rules step by step so a couple more times this way like that into the little sliding step or try and do it a bit try and do it a bit bigger if you can if you want to go to a more advanced more advanced it's harder than it looks to just pivot on the on the foot like that just like it's harder than it looks to, to do a back uh, a low back sweeping wash you traditional wash you i should say and the other way so one and then we start with this first using the somatic timing one, two, like that, and then just one, relax us back down with the somatic timing. So remember when I said like it's not just in the shoulders, it's in the whole body. So the whole thing just for a split second it just relaxes back. But when we say relax, this is one of the reasons why in the old days they, they do postures like and they use this very emphasized somatic timing that you don't want to relax like like remember i talked about boji Kong talking about him shin chuan like hitting and then relaxing that they don't want those moments where the structure becomes relaxed and when i talked about the posture's got to remain springy all the time and we'll talk about that when we talk about defense if you do it like like the old guy with this bounce like that it maintains that that springy structure but actually you can get the movement much much shorter we need that particularly in the modern world where everyone's fight level is is too slow that someone's in already someone's already hitting you by the time you're bouncing back up so we get that somatic timing much much shorter but we don't we keep exactly the same physiological principles it's just shorter that's all and we also don't we don't relax so we keep that same principle as well so it's more even though it just even though it's shorter we don't actually relax like floppy like that we just go back with the quarter routine like that and then we just change it into the, the sliding set And 
we can use exactly that same principle of the sliding set just with an individual like that. Which you know it might not look like, like when you do it like that, it's like what's that for? And then when you're starting up, you just open the door that we've talked about this. You're just changing you, just changing your angles as your opponent comes in. That uses a sliding set. It's just a bigger slide, and it lands on the this kind of kickback route, but spinning like a spinning kickback route in like that. You don't always land it spot on, but. You don't always need to, it doesn't matter if you're just like a little bit off balance with it, and particularly if you make contact, it doesn't matter that much. It just sets there like that. It still sets on the front foot as well, the heel as you hits into the floor to solidify the, the heel goes out a little bit like that, just a little tiny little bit. It sets from both feet. This is the one, it's the leg you're pivoting on that really provides the solidity, so that's the like technically speaking, in terms of the laws of physics, that's the one where the, the power is generated from because it's the solid movement like that. And this just stabilizes it. Nevertheless, we call it a we call it a sliding set. Another really good exercise before we did jab, jab step through, jab. Now we do cross, and we just change on the spot into the kickback kickback routine like that. So. So breaking it down now, splitting the splitting the timing one, two into each lock point like that. Now we change it, we bring in our somatic timing. The moment you do that, it becomes more challenging. The moment you do that, you'll feel that you have to make these decisions about power. So we'll try and get 50-50 power first with the with the move. Like that. And you can see straight away that from being flat on, it goes to the side, goes to the side like that. It's not one, two, straight back. It's got to come out. So it doesn't have to. Like if you were, like against the wall, you could do it, you know. But the reason is just balancing and strengthening the posture. So it's, one, it's just stronger to have a little bit of a wide. And it's also vulnerable, but so it's just standing there, you know. Plenty of videos where people just stood there like that and someone just goes boom like that, just knocks them right over. So the front foot just comes out in a little bit of a bigger triangle step, like, like, like that. We use our somatic time. You can hear the difference. If I break the somatic timing, just do it lock point by lock point. It's one, two. It's like one, two, one, two. It's got that kind of feeling to it. This is the, you know, when Wang Shenzhai talks about fusing the elements of Shaolin and Wudang, that you've got one, two, one, two, and in Wudang you've got hit, hit and flow, as we've talked about before. When you bring them together, then you you rediscover this key concept of the ancients, this use of the, the somatic timing. So this is very much just like, you know, it could just, it, it could just be like, two like that. It's that kind of posture but it's fusing the elements together. So. And also, you know, obviously a little bit of cultural interaction with Western boxing for these particular kinds of movements. Again, another dialectic, another contradiction, which a lot of people don't like because they're fixated on some kind of ethnic purity concept. That's what Wang Shenzhai was facing at the time. People fixated on an ethnic purity concept. I mean, Wang Shenzhai himself says like you should, it doesn't matter whether it's from inside China or outside China, but the reality is he wasn't that keen on the kind of Yao Zong Zun incorporation so much of Western boxing. He was keener on the more Xing Yi Chuan. It's a debate you can have, it's a debate people do have and people like, it's this whole thing of like, the older it is, the purer people think it is. The French philosopher Jacques Derrida talks about this idea. It's one of the concepts embedded, not just in China, but in the Western world. It's one of the fundamental concepts that we don't recognize that, that we used to think with binary distinctions is another one. But the idea that if something's older, it's superior and how people then 
structure that into ideology. So thinking like, well, those people who trained with Wang Shenzhai earlier had something purer, and then again repeating that. So even the people who reject that and support Yao Zong Zong, not that you should be supporting one or the other, even those people are then like, oh, these people trained with Yao Zong Zong earlier, so they're purer. So it just, it never ends, it just never ends. So why Yao Zong Zong told us is that we've got to think about quintessence principles of movement in dialectical harmony with the reality of the context of the fight. That's the only thing that we can make the determination of. Nothing else, none of your ideologies matter. It's just that. So, one, two, when we bring in the, the somatic timing, you feel it straight away, like, if I'm doing them separately, each one's got 100% power, like that. And I can even get that quite fast, quite fast like that, um, so that they go to like, it's 50-50, but the overall power level drops anyway. So, as soon as we bring it into somatic timing, then the power level drops. It's just, it's just inevitable that the power level drops. And to a certain degree, particularly for the second one, we can use what I've talked about, this concept of compensatory force, that you use the whole explosive movement to add more power into the, into the punch. This one's just relying purely on your, on your power generation. And to go, to use the somatic timing, the curtailment of the movement, we lose some of the penetrating force because it's going to be pulled back a lot sooner into the into the second one. So it's usually very often, as I've said before, it's usually the last posture that it's easiest to put all the to put more power into, and that's the reason why you very often see people go one, two, three, one, two, three, just because it's easier. But as I said in the previous video, for today's each one, we want to go past that. We want to evolve that and think about. It's a more profound use of our E if we can actually decide out of a three, four punch combination, where's the power going to be distributed to and how do we do that? But certain things we can't get past. We want to get more penetrating power into that. We've got to sacrifice a little bit more of our somatic timing to get the, the next one in. And the more we do that, the more it starts going back to the Shingi Chuan paradigm where it's more individual blocky movements and we lose the ability to use fast combinations that I've talked about multiple times. This is what it means to be a science. This is what it means to say that each one is a science, to be thinking like this and it's scientific development. Facing these problems, thinking about how we use all the, the things that are available to solve those problems. There's no, there's no set answers, there's just continuous progression and learning. And of course it's exactly the same, one, two, the other way. You can maybe see a little bit clearer now that this foot goes out more. It's not a flat stamp, it's going to come straight back, it'll be straight back like that. So. And these are all means of like generating extra force and, and solidifying the posture into the hit point, the set point. That's where it's set. So again, like that. One more. Hits lock point, set point, configuration, correct consistency, and then consideration of the reality of the fight. The guards up, recognizing that this this is a weak a weak posture. And again, I've talked about this idea. I'm not going to talk about it today, but from the changing straight away from the using this because it's overdetermined in another way that we've not, we've, I've only hinted at, hinted at it before and I've hinted at it earlier in earlier videos that this springiness of the pivot roof allows you to change very quickly and to, to change like, so even if you are just for a split second off balance, you can spring into another posture. That's a little bit higher level, so we'll look at it another time. So one more that you can practice and you can devise, you know, you can just, you can just think about any of the, any of the, postures that we've looked at, putting them together in a two movement combination with explosive footwork and just kind of a bit of a play, thinking about how the footwork would function with it and why hopefully don't get injured because see that's that's what we want a good system to do is to kind of save that, save us the time and the pain of doing it wrong and realising how you go over your ankle if you do that. Anyway we'll do this, we'll do this, that's the way we this kind of 
push with the scrape routing. I remember I talked about this being, this is how we discovered somatic timing originally. One, and change into the, I think I talked the sample, one, two, like that, into a, into a crossbow. We're doing to a, we shift with our step that we've been practicing. And again, you've got to practice these right so that you don't go forward. It's really easy, I'm telling you, to buckle over by putting your weight forward when you go into the explosive step. And because it's a pivot kind of pivot route, or it will be if you're leaning forward, you can go over on your ankle. So you've got to keep you keep your weight back. Your foot's got to lift a little bit, otherwise the edge of the shoe can just stub into the ground. And that also can book and pop your ankle out. All like just fine grained little details. So we're going to go one, two. I'm going to use that somatic timing to bounce into the next, the next movement, just like the old kind of movement that you see quite, you know, big version of it in the old Ichiro Masters. So like that. All off the spot and the other way. And again, it's exactly the same principle that you've got to think about how is the power distributed. If I want to do a full, if I want to do a full posture like that, I've got to go into a full set. So the principle that we're, that I've been getting up at all along in this video is like, when we make this distribution between power levels, like I can do one, two, and they can both be full power, or I can do one, two, yeah, it sets, but we call this like a half set, so it bounces straight. There's enough time, or you could put the setting for much longer. I could really set it in for a second rather than we want, like a whatever it is, a quarter of a second or something like that. Normally it's half a second. But when we change into that posture, we can only half set the posture because we're distributing the, the weight, the power generation evenly 50-50 and then the length of time of the set changes depending on which one we're going to emphasize the emphasize the power in. I hope that makes sense anyway. So it's like it's nothing to like to do it to understand it physically. It's like let's just start, it's nothing. But to try and explain it is a little bit it's a little bit harder but you can feel it yourself like well I can't just fully commit to that and set the posture full on and let all my force go forward into that if if I want to be really fast and and hit them. So it might be that I do that and he's already gone flying by the time I change and, and and it's too late. So and it might be that I don't really move him with the it's not that big a deal this kind of set before for all it being massively emphasized in each one it's not that big a deal. So I might just move him I might just even just distract him a little bit before I change into the that's quite an odd an odd movement but so I might actually want, you know, a much faster somatic timed based movement, in which case it's inevitable that I'm going to sacrifice power on the push into the thing, or I'm going to break the somatic timing to and do it as kind of like two separate files. I'm going to break that compound file and change it into chain file Remember I talked about compound file is when the, the movement is so close together, it becomes like one that's one movement. Whereas chain farley is one after the other, like one, two, like that. So it's whether you're going to do the compound farley or you're going to do the chain farley. That depends whether you're going to do full sets, half sets, how long the set is, and what the power distribution is going to be between the, the postures. Anyway, that's enough for today. So I hope that was really, really useful. Yeah, it's sophisticated stuff, but that's what you want, isn't it? So one love, keep learning, keep practicing, keep standing. And I'll see you in the next one.